Are you ready to get started? Yes. First and foremost, giving all glory to God, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our beloved Pastor Chris, Pastor Melissa. Um, you know, I've noticed you guys, there's been a, an influx of new members here in our church. Yeah. So many new faces. So much so that I don't recognize, I'm shooting now at maybe like 5%. I used to could go to all three services and know at least 50 to 60% of the faces now. But hey, we're giving all glory to God because I love the expansion of his kingdom. And so many of you are coming home. Amen. That being said, I'm pretty sure most of you are wondering, especially those of you who've only been here for a few months, why does Pastor Chris and myself always pose the same question before we start our message? Are you ready for God's word? Well, there's a reason behind that, believe it or not. You might be thinking that it's Pastor Chris' way of getting you hyped up and knowing him, it kind of is. <laughs> but actually, the first reason is that's the, the phrase marker to start recording the footage that we're going to air on our website and also on YouTube. But the second reason, which is far more important, is he's asking to gauge the posture of your hearts. What kind of attitude did you walk into God's house with? And yes, I am looking at my men. Did you get up this Sunday? Turn on the worship music. Give praise to your holy God and get your family up with enthusiasm. You can get quiet. <laughs> that speaks volumes. Did you get up intentionally excited about the things of the Lord? Or is it the opposite? Were you dragging, thinking to yourselves, all right, it's Sunday. We got to go to church. Let's get it over with. Let's be honest. And you might be thinking, okay, there he goes again, getting on to the men. Listen, I'm trying to encourage you. As Pastor Chris always says, I'm trying to help you if you let me. It starts with you. God put that responsibility in our hands, not our wives. It starts with you. What's important to you will be important to the family. Take it seriously. I'm just saying. Are you ready to get started? Yes, the Bible says in Psalms chapter 100, verse 2, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. And yes, I'm still talking to my men. Did you come into God's house praising him with joy? Or were your hands in your pockets? You know what? Let me stop. Let me stop. I digress. So we're going to continue with our sermon series, The Christian Life. The first topic in this sermon series, Pastor Chris talked about the going out and coming in involved in our walk with Jesus. Remember that? And how it's directly connected to our witness and our worship with regards to spiritual warfare. And then last week, we talked about what? Working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And this is the perspective at which we view and respond to God and his word. Today, we're going to focus on unity, a concept that is extremely important to Jesus and should be extremely important to us. Now, we have three bullet points to cover. The first is going to be we're going to sort of look at what unity is. The second, a unity killer. And then lastly, how we acquire oneness. Are you with me? Yes. Are you ready to get started? Yes. All right, number one, what does unity look like? Many think that unity means sameness. 
This is not true. Unity is not uniformity. Instead, unity can be defined as any group of people who are characterized by the same purpose, vision, or direction. It's not about being the exact same. Does that make sense? It's about advancing toward the same goal. Think about a football team like the 49ers. <laughs> there are different positions, different skill set, roles, and responsibilities, but all players march toward the same end zone. Their goal is the same. Now ask yourselves, what's the goal of our Christian life? Think about that. When I was in college, I played basketball. And my freshman year was our best team. It wasn't the most talented team, but it was our best team. And what made us the best during that particular season was because we were united. And there was this pivotal point during preseason where you could see it all sort of coming together. You know that pivotal point in the movie on, um, in, in Rudy or Hoosiers or remember the Titans? See, first service had no clue what I was talking about. <laughs> that pivotal point where you're like, oh, yes, you can see it all coming together. Well, during preseason is a time where we're enduring conditioning to get ready for the season. We're running like 20,000 miles a day, and the coach is trying to kill us. <laughs> we had this one particular drill called horses, where you have to run the span of a, a basketball court in increments. You start at one baseline, run to half, I mean, to the free throw line, then back. Run to half court, then back. Run all the way to the other free throw line, then back. Then run full court, and then all the way back. And that's just one. And we had to do that in 28 seconds, the entire team. And we were right at the very end. We had one more to go, and coach told us, if you, whoever doesn't finish it on time has to start all over again. And we had some big guys on our team, 6'8", six, 6'9", six, got to the last one, two of them didn't finish. So, and you'd have thought this was scripted. We all looked at each other, because coach told those two men, get back on the line, those dreaded words, back on the line. We all looked at each other, and didn't say a word, and the entire team got on the line. We ran. And coach was screaming at us. We were actually laughing the whole time. And we knew at that point in time, we knew it was all coming together. We knew that no one could break us or tear us apart, not even our coach. And we had our most successful season that year. We won our conference and advanced to the Sweet 16 in the nation that year. First time that school had ever done that because we were one. I tell you that because there's power in unity. There is strength in unity, amen? Yes. Now let's get a little bit more technical. The definition of the term epitome is typical or ideal. Basically, it means the perfect example, representation or manifestation of something. So what pops into your mind when you think of the epitome of unity. The 49ers? <laughs> no? Well, during the Olympic season over the summer, my wife and I happened to catch a video of our United States synchronized swimming team. Check out this video. Oh my gosh. Do we have any synchronized swimmers in the house today? Because if we do, I got some questions for you. Did you see that? Could you imagine the amount of preparation, sacrifice, sheer practice that it took to do that? I was getting tired just looking at them. I mean, it's one thing to dance on dry land, but they're in water. Chlorine splashing in their eyes. If you looked hard enough, they were smiling underwater. <laughs> Amazing. 
amazing. So when we think about what unity looks like and the examples of unity, are they really perfect? Are they ideal? I'm pretty sure most will have flaws and shortcomings. Even what we just saw, believe it or not, the U.S. was in fourth place, scored fourth place. I think it was Japan who won the gold. So apparently there was something in the routine you just saw that was flawed. I can't imagine what it was, but it was. We see the perfect example of unity within the Trinity. The Trinity refers to God eternally existing in three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three persons are equally God. However, each person has a distinct role or function within the Godhead. And the three exist in perfect fellowship and community. Yet there is not three separate gods, but only one. That is, the Godhead is perfectly unified. Does that make sense? A little bit? Now, I'm sure many of you have heard different examples that try and explain the Trinity. I think the most popular one is the, the water example and how it exists in three different states, solid, liquid, and gas. Have you all heard that? Well, believe it or not, that particular model is actually flawed within itself too. So when it comes to describing the Trinity, I like to refer to scripture. Isaiah says in chapter 40, verse 25, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, asked the Lord. And I think that's the point. Our God is so big, what can you compare to him? Water certainly does not. We try to define using the finite to describe the infinite. It doesn't work. Are you with me? You see, unity establishes oneness that will not negate individuality. Remember, each member of the Trinity has a separate role, and God in his infinite wisdom replicated this reality in his creation. God's design was to always have differences among people, seen by different races, colors, shapes, and styles. Every race is unique and possesses a unique individuality. And yet God, his desire for his people is to embrace their uniqueness while also maintaining Christian unity. He wants us to follow his perfect example. Amen? Amen. Number two, a unity killer. When we think of some of the leading causes for division within the church, we tend to think about issues ranging from politics to racism, wouldn't you say? But there's another issue that's a bit more subtle that tends to fly under the radar but has a significant level of influence. You want to know what it is? Complaining. Complaining. It has far-reaching implications. Would you purposefully destroy unity within your closest relationships? Would you make it your goal in life to plant seeds of doubt in others about those who serve us. Now, most of you are probably saying to yourselves, no. Brother Jamie, that is everything from silly to thoughtless. Of course not. But here's the thing. Every time we complain, that's being accomplished. Every time. It infects everyone who hears it. 
I once heard that complaining is essentially like emotional air pollution. Spreading it is like sneezing. Everyone's going to breathe in the microbes. If someone complains about the mayor, others are going to chime in. If you are a man complaining about women, other men will robustly jump right in. And vice versa with women, don't act like it's just us. <laughs> Complaining doesn't happen in a vacuum. Being baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit is being called to be ambassadors of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Our goal is to invite people into unity with the Holy Spirit. Complaining is the opposite of being God's ambassador. When we complain, we wreak havoc on the creation and the perpetuation of unity. You see, unknowingly, we join with the enemy's forces and attack God's essential purpose. The enemy is always out to destroy God's fundamental intention, unity. Jesus repeatedly emphasizes this theme in the high priestly prayer found in the Gospel of John, chapter 17. He repeatedly prays that we become one like he and the Father are one. And we're going to look at this a little bit more later on in the message. Amen? Amen. Now back to complaining. When we complain, we become unity killers. Rather than building God's kingdom, we rip it apart. We cast doubt and break opportunities to build trust in God when we complain. It's like pouring water into the crack in concrete. And we know how durable concrete is. But when the freezing weather comes, that water you poured into that crack freezes up and over time begins to expand, causing that crack to widen. And that hard concrete begins to crumble. Our complaints act the same way in the minds of people. Amen? When we complain about authority figures, president, police, pastors, we cast doubt. When we complain about friends, husbands, wives, brothers and sisters in Christ, we attack God's essential purpose, unity. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And during this point in time, the Apostle Paul is talking to his protege about how to establish unity within the first century church. He says, I urge you, first of all, to pray. Right there. Above all else, what's the first thing we do? Bathe everything in prayer. Take it straight to God. Amen? Amen? He says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Amen? Amen. Complaining has this devastating impact as well. It sends all the wrong messages to God. Do you realize when we complain, we are hurtling in gratitude at God? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. James chapter 5 verse 13 says, are any of you suffering hardships? You should. There is no enthusiasm in this room this morning. 
you should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are you beginning to see how Pastor Chris's example of worship and witness are tying into this? In this example with James, we are either happy or we're sad. We're either going through some stuff or we're not. But in all cases, involve Jesus. If you're happy, sing praises. If you're hurting, do what? Pray. Amen? When we become part of God's family, we get a new identity. We become his children. Amen? At any point in time, have you ever encountered an ungrateful child <laughs> or teenager? Is there anything more annoying than an ungrateful teenager? And what puts an even worse taste in your mouth is the fact that their ungratefulness more than not is aimed at the person who has sacrificed the most for them, the parent. Keep that energy because that's the picture I get in my head when we complain to God. We are these snarky little kids complaining to our Heavenly Father. Amen? The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with what? Grateful hearts. You see, ingratitude blinds us in two ways. We fail to give God credit for his majestic watchfulness over us. In our microscopic view of life, we are sightless to see how he uses all things for our good. Amen. Devastating, confronting experiences build steel in our character. Oftentimes we don't realize it, but that's what's happening if you trust him. Amen? Amen. Seeing through spiritual eyes, they prepare us for the future. Remember, worship, witness, witness, worship. Amen? Amen? Number two, we don't have eyes to see the good God has done for us. Oh, how fast we forget the times he has saved us, the many right decisions the Holy Spirit has guided us in. And the apex of all of God's goodness Salvation through Christ. We forget these things and complain mostly about others. Failing to realize all that he has done for us. Even if he stopped right now, he's done more than enough. Amen? The Bible says in Romans 28, I'm sorry, verse 8, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 28. Are you with me? And now... And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Amen. We need to refocus our eyes no matter how bleak the circumstances. Hope is ever present because Jesus is the object of our hope. Amen. He tells his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you all this so that you will have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Amen. Is your trust, is your faith, is your hope in the one who has overcome the world? Or are you too busy complaining about wanting things your way? Number three, and I am running out of time. How we acquire oneness. When you go to see an orchestra or perhaps a marching band perform, the first notes you're going to hear are going to be chaotic. 
as each individual, individual player is warming up on their instrument. The violin player is doing her thing, drums, guitar, they're doing their thing. And let's be honest, that is the epitome of noise. <laughs> but when the conductor walks on stage and taps his little conductor stick, all the players submit to his direction. And the result is beautiful music. Like I said earlier, in other words, there's power in unity. There's strength in unity. And unity glorifies God like nothing else. In the Gospel of John, it records the longest prayer by Jesus recorded in the Bible. The main concern of that prayer is unity among God's people, which signifies the power and importance of unity. Jesus prayed for believers in all times to be unified. When the body of Christ comes together with one common purpose, family, we can change the world. When we place Jesus at the center of our lives, that within itself creates unity. When we make his word, his will, his ways paramount, we are going to automatically agree on a variety of levels. Well, what do you mean? When it comes to lying, because of what we know about Jesus, we're going to be on the same page about that. When it comes to stealing, murder, we're going to be on the same page because his word is on our hearts through relationship with him. When it comes to politics, uh-oh. <laughs> we should be on the same page. But here's the blessing in this. Even if we're not, even if we're in disagreement about that, we will handle it the prescribed way that Jesus has in his word. Yes. So even in our arguments because of him, yes. we're still united. Amen? Yes. Amen. As the challenges of life arise, and the attacks of the enemy intensify, Pastor Chris always encourages us to double down on the core tenets involved in our walk with Jesus. He tells us, don't run from the cross, run to the cross. He tells us to double down on prayer, double down on feasting on his word, double down on praise and worshiping, because there's a lot to be said for doing that with the brother or sister in Christ right there beside you. Amen? Yes. What's another word we can use to describe engaging in these core tenets with a brother or sister? Fellowship. Fellowship. There's another word. Discipleship. Discipleship, discipleship, discipleship. And yes, I'm looking at my men again. It's extremely important. We treat it like it's optional. I'm just being honest. If we are to be unified, what's important to Jesus is important to us. Our marching orders from our king is not to go out and make churchgoers. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. Because here's the thing about discipleship. We are not meant to walk this Christian life alone. That was never God's intention. It's the enemies. Isolation is a device that he uses. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, when Jesus' disciples are asking him to teach them how to pray, the first two words that he taught them are extremely significant. Just the first two words alone. Our Father. Our. It signifies the fact that you are not an only child. You are not meant to be alone. You have brothers and sisters who will sing and praise with you, who will cry with you, who will celebrate with you, that's God's intended purpose. And then Father. 
Did you know during Jesus' day, Jews rarely used the word father when, when talking about God? But Jesus did it in every single prayer except one to illustrate the level of intimacy that the father wants to have with his children. That's something to celebrate. And it's extremely significant. Amen? Yes. Now, I'm hoping you're at least by now thinking, okay, Brother Jamie, I think I got my hands around what you're talking about. Now, assist me in squeezing this so I can really get close to this. We're talking about the first century church. The Apostle Paul writes, writes a letter to the Philippian church. Turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. This is going to be sort of like the ingredients needed to walk this out. The Bible says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort in his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? The Apostle Paul is asking these rhetorical questions because if you are in an authentic, genuine relationship with Jesus, the answer to these questions is a resounding yes, because that's who he is. So if that's true, if it's a resounding yes, then he goes on to say, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and what? purpose. Much easier said than done, right? So how do we do that then? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Verse 3, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Amen? Amen? Oh, you guys get quiet real quick then. <laughs> so who were the members of the Philippian church? We see in the book of Acts chapter 16 that the members of the church of Philippi came from many different backgrounds. We have Lydia, who was a Jewish wealthy businesswoman in verse 14. A slave girl who was Greek in verse 16 and a prison warden, more than likely a Roman, found in verses 25 through 36. It's hard to imagine them gathering in the same place, and it would be difficult for them to be united even if they did gather. Just the slightest bit of friction would be cause for them to be disunited. Wouldn't you agree? Imagine you had Dozens of marbles in a plastic bag. The container would hold them together. The marbles would fall and scatter if that container is torn. Wouldn't you say? Now imagine you had a magnet and you're holding that to a bag, a plastic bag of iron dust. The particles of dust will attach themselves to the magnet, be drawn to it. The items in the container are drawn to the magnet, not because they're in the container, but because of the force of the magnet. Are you starting to pick up what I'm putting down? You see, Paul's letter to the Philippians demonstrates the true condition of unity in Christ. Unity in Christ. Unity in Christ. Christ is not just someone who unites them. Christ is the magnet that attracts and attaches them. A place, a container can be deceiving. People can be in the same place, even church, but have a time bomb ready to explode. In contrast, the people of Philippi were bound together by their relationship with Christ. He was at the center. It wasn't about their outward similarities. 
their unity grew stronger and stronger as they put aside self-interest and selfishness and grew to be more and more like Christ. If everyone is committed to growing in him, there would be no more self-interest. Amen? Amen? And this should happen in God's churches today. Be honest with me, real quick. How much time did you spend today praising God? Asking for things doesn't count. <laughs> Reading a verse in scripture does not count. I'm asking you, how much time did you spend staring at him and telling him how amazing he is? The Bible says we were enemies of God, destined to face his wrath. Let that sink in. I think we have the tendency when we hear the word wrath to think about man's wrath, which does not compare to the wrath of God. The Bible says that Jesus was tortured on the cross to appease the wrath of God for us. Does that still move you? Be honest. And on top of that, you are reconciled and adopted as his child. How can we go a day without praising him for this? And on top of all of that, because of the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross, his spirit now abides in you. Don't just give this a head nod. Marvel at this. You see, when we lose our praise, our worship, we've lost all hope for unity. Our lack of praise could be another major reason why we lack unity. When we forget about, when we stop talking about the treasure we have in Jesus, all is lost. It's all about Jesus. We are distracted and have the tendency to focus more on the gifts versus the gifter. And it has always been about the gifter. Our holy God. We're breathing right now because he is the one that gives us breath. Amen. Use your next breath for its intended purpose. Bless the Lord. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Bible says, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and everything that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen? Amen. We can't start our days without praise. We can't. That's God's intention for us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God in his, God is so rich in mercy and loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Amen. Does that still move you? Amen. Let's take it further. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. The Bible says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed, freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Fill your hearts with worship. Fill your hearts with worship. Once we lose our fascination, we lose our effectiveness. Our words end up doing more harm than good. Division is the devil's desire, who carries it out through worldly desires or desires of the flesh. The Bible teaches us that a divided kingdom or homes will not stand. 
that division will result in destruction. Amen? Amen. 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 The key to unity is love, humility, and to seek and find mutual benefit, not just seeking our own self-interest. We used to have such a hard time not thinking about ourselves. Amen? Amen? It's all about Jesus. He is the key to our harmony. If we are honestly, earnestly seeking his face in all that we do, in all that we do, he'll make the path straight for us. If we choose to follow the example that he set for us, it, will, it will, within itself will bring about harmony. Amen? Amen? So we have the tendency to expect results from various efforts we put in, wouldn't you say? The results of this unity, one heart and one mind, are extraordinary blessings that include answered prayers. We see this in Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 through 20. Blessed lives, Psalms 133, verses 1 through 3. And most of all, because it's all about the gift. It's all about the gifter. Glory for God. Romans chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. The Bible says, may God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you to live in complete harmony with each other as fitting for followers of Christ then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given the glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's why Jesus wants us to continue to be united and strong in him. We can build each other, grow spiritually, and stay afloat amid various forms of conflict through unity. That's why we should strive for one heart and one mind. As we close and prepare our hearts for communion and the music begins to play, how many of you in here were able to attend Encounter a couple of weeks ago? Good, quite a few of you, amen. For those of you who have not, I encourage you to come and attend our next encounter. It will bless your lives richly. So with that in mind, I'd like you to imagine, to picture, to envision your Savior standing on this platform and praying these words to the Father over you. Close your eyes and pray with me. Jesus says, now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will be ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. And all God's children say, Amen. 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 Family unity is only achieved. Oneness is only acquired through Jesus. For the body that was broken for us to be one. For the blood that was shed to make us right with our Father. Glory to God, amen. 
Second service, I love you guys. Have a great Sunday.